So, um, uh, like I think some of the other speakers noted, and the um, uh, pandemic has really brought to the forefront um, uh, the the saliency of time, and in particular the lack of changes in context uh, from working at home and uh, stress and probably a number of other things has really distorted our, our perception and memory for time um, in weird ways. Uh, so I don't know if you're anything like me, uh, you might feel like the hours and days kind of drag on, whereas sometimes in retrospect and memory, it feels like you know weeks and months um, have like disappeared. Um, whereas if you think back to early on in the pandemic or even before the pandemic, it might feel like a totally different lifetime. Uh, so it's those kind of extra long time scale memories that I'm particularly interested in talking about today and, and specifically how uh, we remember the uh, when of those events. So how we remember when those events occurred. So for example, maybe you want to um, recall some uh, recent cultural, shared cultural events, like, for example, when um, Tiger King was released, the um, documentary of the infamous Joe Exotic, um, or when Trump got COVID, or maybe when uh, Oprah's interview with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry was. Um, so if you thought to yourself, 14 months, eight months, and three months, then you're in really great shape. Um, so the question that um, I hope to address here is how, how we actually retrieve that kind of um, information. And there are at least sort of two broad classes of theories about how what sort of information we use to make these temporal judgments. On the one hand, um, you can infer temporal information from simple item strength. So the strength of a memory trace. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're lucky, maybe your memory for Tiger King has slowly faded away uh, and decayed over time. And that is the general trajectory of how um, memories fade. And because their strength uh, declines with time, uh, that means that uh, they're correlated. So you can actually use item strength to infer how much time has passed. Uh, and there's actually some really nice behavioral data suggesting um, that uh, manipulations of item strength independent of time can actually uh, distort uh, your memory for when things occurred. So the stronger the item strength is, the more recent you think it occurred. Um, but you might want a temporal representation that's a little bit more precise or, or uh, kind of separable from this um, item strength account. Um, and there's this other kind of class of theories that basically suggests um, that you associate each event with uh, a sort of location in time. Um, and so that might be related to a temporal context representation or a time tag or something like that, but the event becomes associated with a particular location in time and that gives you relatively more precise um, information about when that event occurred. So, you know, for the example of Tiger King, you might remember that it came out in March um, or you might remember sort of a more general temporal context like there was um, a coincident uh, global catastrophe happening at the time. So one plausible neural mechanism for a location kind of theory or time tag um, is time cells that I probably don't have to explain to this audience, but I will just for a reminder for folks who aren't um, in this world, uh, but time cells were first discovered um, in RAT CA1 and since have been uh, shown to exist elsewhere in the brain and in the MTL um, and, I, and also uh, have been discovered in humans. And I think we're actually gonna be able to hear a little bit more about that later today during the data blitzes. Um, and basically the idea is that there are cells that fire a particular moment in time from a stimulus during a delay period that can give you a good readout of uh, when that event occurred. But generally speaking, the, these 
time scales are um, relatively short. So on the order of several seconds to maybe tens of seconds. So it's not completely clear how this would scale up to support memory on the order of you know, weeks or months. However, there is some promising data that shows that this does scale. So for example, in the same region in CA1, you can uh, from place cells decode relatively precisely um, what day uh, what day the, the, the neural recordings are from. Um, and more recently, it's been shown that just looking at the population of cells that, that um, encode sort of this fine grain temporal information can also be used to decode this like coarser grain temporal information on the order of days. Um, so this is really exciting because it suggests that there might be this kind of scale invariance of this neural representation that you can use to scale up um, to days and maybe beyond, maybe to weeks and beyond. Okay, but these signals haven't really been related to temporal memory, so memory for explicit um, uh, judgments of, of time. Um, the temporal memory literature is has focused largely on uh, memory for, for temporal information on the order of seconds, maybe tens of seconds, basically trial level. Um, although there are a handful of studies that have expanded um, that to uh, you know, longer time scales. So in particular, memory for time, the order of tens of minutes up to an hour. So I'll just uh, mention a couple. Um, so, uh, in this study, the authors found that the hippocamp hi hippocampal activation was associated with encoding temporal information um, that was associated with accuracy in coarse temporal memory, so on the order of an, an experimental session. And more recent data from Mike Yasta's group has shown that at retrieval, increased activation in the hippocampus is associated with higher temporal memory precision, again, on the order of like an experimental session. Um, and interestingly, this effect is not only seen in hippocampus, but also in entorhinal and perirhinal cortices. Okay, but these timescales are still, uh, although they're longer, they're still uh, relatively short. And what we really wanted to know um, was how do we remember when events occurred across much longer timescales, in this case, from weeks to months. And we were really lucky uh, to have access to a data set that allowed us to ask that question. Um, so that data set uh, is called the Natural Scenes Data Set, and I just want to acknowledge the folks who uh, collected that data, conceptualized the experiment, and all of it, uh, Kendrick Kay, Thomas Nasolaris, Emily Allen, and Yihan Wu from the University of Minnesota. Um, and I flag uh, the website here in case you're interested in learning more about it. The uh, data set is going to be coming public um, by the end of the year, probably in a couple of months. So if folks are interested, I definitely recommend that you check it out. Um, so basically what they were interested in is bridging models of uh, vision neuroscience to computer vision. And so what they needed was um, a lot of data um, and they chose to go the kind of massive sampling of relatively few subjects approach that uh, Ariel Timbini talked about earlier. Um, so the experiment looks something like this. There were um, eight subjects that were scanned across eight to 10 months um, and 30 to 40 sessions. So they were scanned approximately uh, once a week, although there is variability in that. Um, and they were exposed to 10,000 images across that time frame, and each image was repeated three times. Um, and you know the reason that they did this was uh, so that they could, uh, you know, build these models of, of uh, neurally informed computer vision, and um, so they needed tons of images and repetitions. But they also needed a cover task, and so my collaborator um, Ben Hutchinson. Uh, was able to convince them because they have repetitions and because they needed people to stay awake to basically turn the cover task into a memory task, which is very fortunate for all of us who care about memory. So across, um, uh, so, all, so the entire time they were seeing these images, they were performing a continuous recognition task. 
So just the simple old new, have you seen this image before? Yes or no? Um, each image was presented uh, on for three seconds, off for one second. And I, I don't think I mentioned, but this is um, high resolution data acquired from, or relatively high resolution data acquired from 7T. So it was acquired in 1.8 isotropic space. Um, and the images that were used were from this COCO data set, uh, which is, um, stands for uh, common objects and context. And it's really, uh, it's a common uh, data uh, set of images in computer vision. And it's great if you care about content analysis because all of these images are super well annotated. Okay, so that is my advertisement for the Natural Scenes Data Center, or NSD as we call it. But what we were really interested in was the final memory test. So we uh, were able to bring participants back um, for a behavioral session. We didn't have a lot of time with them, uh, but we were able to um, give them a final memory test on 320 images um, where we asked for every image. So like this surfer dude, have you seen this image before? Um, on a six point scale this time, rather than simple old new. How many times did you see this image? They were always seen three times, remember? And when was the first time that you saw that image? And this is, we're particularly interested in the temporal memory test. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the recognition test as well. And I'm gonna show data from the frequency test. Even though they were all presented three times, not a single subject performed above chance on this, which is kind of surprising. Uh, but I think it was just um, a lot of bias in that. Okay, so this is a example trajectory of an image that um, they might encounter. So uh, for the surfer, this is uh, taken, this is real data uh, or a real um, sequence. Uh, the first time they see the image might be in session 15, day 105. The second time they see it might be you know, 15 sessions later then see the last time on session 34, and finally do the memory test um, at the end uh, after all the scanning has happened in day 269. So as, as an example, we're really asking them to remember when they saw it over very long time scales. So it's over 100 days, uh, several months. Okay, so first I'm going to show you the recognition memory data. Um, and uh, you know, this is just showing the hit rate, so old responses to old images and false alarm rate, old responses to new images, um, just to show you that this is, uh, this performance was significantly above chance uh, across all subjects. And, you know, at these time scales, I think this is still pretty impressive, um, as expected that uh, uh, sensitivity scales with confidence. Um, and what I want to show you is the effect of lag on recognition. Um, and I'll just show you uh, the data first and walk you through what the lags refer to, or what they mean. So here we have um, the four different lags. Lag zero is just um, how long in the experiment is the first time that you saw it, how, how far into the experiment. So um, there's no significant effect of lag zero here, but if this had come out, uh, that's basically saying that um, the longer lag zero is the worse your recognition memory is. So there's kind of like a primacy effect. Um, lag one and lag two were excitingly both uh, significantly positive. And what that basically reflects is a spacing effect over these really long time scales. Um, so the more spread out the repetitions were, the better for your recognition memory. And the last lag is basically just forgetting. So it's um, for recognition, how far, uh, from the last time you saw it to the to the time that you're tested. Uh, so there's a strong effect of forgetting there. And I like this graph just because it um, shows kind of all these classic memory effects in one. But what we're really interested in is temporal memory. So um, to measure temporal memory, we can take the actual position and compare it to the, the response, the positional response, the, the subjective position. And we changed these, uh, we, yeah, we adjusted them to rank just to account for bias in the use of the number line. So people tend to be really compressed when um, in their usage of the number line. Um, so to deal with bias, we just converted it to rank. And what we can do is just correlate these to see um, if there is 
you know, above chance memory, uh, we would expect that their subjective position be correlated with the actual position. And indeed, that is what we find um, at the group level. And I think, yeah, it's significant in seven out of eight of the subjects, and it's trending in the last subject. So I think this is pretty exciting that we can get um, off chance temporal memory um, in uh, across these really long time scales. And again, this is incidental in the sense that, yes, they're tested for memory in the continuous recognition task, but they never know that they're going to be tested on temporal memory. Um, okay, so what we want uh, is a uh, sort of item level measure of temporal memory precision. So we can get that by comparing the ranked actual position to the ranked subjective position. So the closer they are, the more precise we think that is. And so we're just going to binarize items into high precision and low precision and look at um, effects that predict that. So showing the um, same lag effects on temporal memory, um, here, what we see is a strong recency effect. So the longer lag zero is um, the better for temporal memory. So uh, that kind of makes sense because it's basically saying the later in the experiment you saw it the, for the first time, the better your memory for when you saw it the first time is. Right? Uh, but interestingly, there were um, there's no effect of spacing and um, there's not really an effect of the last lag from repetition to final memory, which is nice because it suggests that people were really able to uh, hone in more on the um, first repetition, which is what we're asking temporal memory for. Okay, so turning to the neural data, we're interested um, in whether there was uh, encoding retrieval similarity or repetition to repetition similarity that predicted temporal memory. Okay, um, so as a first pass, we just um, you, uh, took the average similarity from each uh, pair, uh, so each pairwise correlation and split that into high and low temporal memory precision. And we focused in on MTL, and this is what we found. So um, we were excited because the um, CA1 showed significantly higher uh, pattern similarity for high precision versus low precision items, and so did the entorhinal cortex. The CA23DG uh, showed a trending effect, but it didn't survive multiple comparisons correction. And so we were excited about this because these are basically the, the, the regions a priori that we would have expected to um, be sensitive to time, at least at the fine grain level. Uh, so we also wanted to control for lag, um, which can have a big effect on similarity and recognition confidence. And we still see in a, a mixed effects multiple regression model that CA1 and, and enterrhinal um, similarity predicts pattern, or predicts temporal memory precision. Importantly, this is not what we see for recognition memory. Um, so parahippocampal cortex um, uh, is the only region that we see where pattern similarity predicts recognition memory. Um, we can also break this down by repetition, and I'll just show this really quickly. The R1, R2 uh, similarity seems to be driving this effect, which is consistent with the idea that you're kind of reinstating um, uh, temporal information from the first repetition. And super quickly, um, this is item specific if we um, sort of control for similarity between really well-matched items, we still see a significant effect uh, for CA1 predicting temporal memory precision and a marginal effect for enterrhinal. Okay, so to summarize, um, temporal memory seems to persist across months, which is exciting, and it seems to be separable from item strength. Um, uh, pattern reinstatement in CA1 and maybe enterrhinal, uh, so reinstating that um, you know, contextual information uh, support, seems to support temporal memory precision, which is consistent with this um, kind of time tag uh, idea that I introduced earlier. And finally, the same regions that encode fine grain temporal information seem to also be involved in these very long time scale memory judgments. And I just want to thank again um, my co authors on this, Putin Zo and Ben Hutchinson, um, and this team of NSD in particular, Kendra Kay for uh, giving us access to this data, Yanchari for help. Um, 
on the final memory test and Wanjia Guo for segmenting hippocampal subfields for us uh, and the rest of my lab. Thank you.